Shiva Trilogy. The Immortals of Maluha. Shiva and Nandi were walking back to the royal guest house. Shiva had decided he wanted to eat lunch alone. Nandi walked a few steps behind. His head bowed in self-recremation. My lord, I'm so sorry. Shiva turned around to gaze at Nandi. You're right, my lord. We were so lost in our own troubles and the search for the Nilkant that we didn't realize the unfairness of our actions on immigrants. I misled you, my lord. I lied to you. Shiva didn't say anything. He continued to stare intensely into Nandi's eyes. I'm so sorry, my lord. I've failed you. I will accept whatever punishment, whatever punishment you give me. Shiva's lips broke into a very faint smile. He patted Nandi lightly on his shoulders. Signaling he had forgiven him, but his eyes delivered a clear message. Never lie to me again, my friend. Nandi nodded and whispered, Never, my lord. I'm so sorry. Forget it, Nandi, said Shiva. His smile a little broader now. It's in the past. They turned and continued walking. Suddenly, Shiva shook his head and chuckled slightly. Strange people. What is it, my lord? asked Nandi. Nothing really. I was just wondering at some of the interesting things about your society. Interesting, my lord? asked Nandi, feeling a little more confident now that Shiva was speaking to him again. Well, some people in our country think just the presence of my blue throat can help you achieve impossible task. Some people actually think that my name has suddenly become so holy that they can't even speak it. Nandi smiled slightly. On the other hand, continued Shiva, some people clearly think that I'm not required. In fact, they even think that my touching them is so polluting that I need to get a Shuddhikaran done. Shuddhikaran? Why would you need that, my lord? asked Nandi, a little concerned. Shiva weighed his words carefully. Well, I touched someone and I was told that I would need to undergo a Shuddhikaran. What? Who did you touch, my lord? Was it a Vikarma person? asked the troubled Nandi. Only the touch of a Vikarma person would mean that you would need to get a Suddhikaran. Shiva's face abruptly changed color. A veil lifted from his eyes. He suddenly understood the significance of the event of the previous day. Her hasty withdrawal at being touched, the shocked reaction from the Guruji and Kritika. Go back to the guest house, Nandi. I will see you there, said Shiva. As he turned towards the guest house garden, My lord, what happened? asked Nandi, trying to keep pace with Shiva. Did you get the Shuddhikaran done or not? Go to the guest house, Nandi, said Shiva, walking rapidly away. I will see you there. Shiva waited for a larger part of an hour, but it was in vain. For Sati did not make an appearance. He sat on the bench of himself, cursing the moment when that terrible thought had entered his mind. How could I have even thought that Sati would find my touch polluting? I'm such a bloody idiot. He replayed moments of that fateful encounter in his mind and analyzed every facet of it. If something happened to you, I would never be able to forgive myself. What would she mean by saying that? Does she have feelings for me? Or is she just an honorable woman who can't bear to be the cause of someone else's misfortune? And why should she think of herself as inferior. This entire concept of the Vikarma is so damned ridiculous. Realizing that she wasn't going to come, Shiva got up. He kicked the bench hard, getting a painful reminder that his once numb toe had got its sensation back. Cursing out loud, he started walking back to the guest house. Walking past the stage, he noticed that there was something lying on the dance floor. He went closer and bent down to pick it up. It was her bracelet. He had seen it on her right hand. The string did not seem broken. Had she purposely dropped it there? 
He smelt it. It had the fragrance of the holy lake on a sun-kissed evening. He brought it delicately to his lips and kissed it gently. Smiling, he dropped the bracelet into the pouch, tied around his wrist. He would come from the Mount Mandar and meet her. He had to meet her. He would pursue her to the end of the world if required. He would fight the entire human race to have her. His journey in this life was incomplete without her. His heart knew it. His soul knew it. How much further is it, Madam Prime Minister? asked Nandi, behaving like an excited child. A visit to the mythical Mount Bandar, the herb where the drink of the gods was manufactured, was a rare honor for any Meluhan. For most Suryavangshis, Mount Mandar was the soul of the entire empire. For long as it was safe, so was the Somras. It's only been an hour since we left Devagiri, Captain, said Kanakala, smiling. It's a day journey to Mount Pandar. Actually, because of the blind on the carriage windows, I can't see anything outside. And I can't tell how much time has gone by since. I can't see the sun either. That's why I was asking. The Prahar lamp is right behind you, Captain. The blinds are down for your our own protections. Shiva smiled at Kankala. He could understand that the blinds were not for their protection, but for the safety of Mount Mandar, to keep its location secret. Very few people knew of its exact location. There was an elite team of soldiers called the Arishtanemi, who protected the road to Mount Mandar and the travelers on it. Except for the scientist of Mount Mandar, the Arishtanami and any person authorized by the emperor nobody was allowed to the mountain or know its locations. If the Chandravangshi terrorists attacked Mount Mandar, all would be lost for Maluha. Who would be meeting their Kanakala? asked Shiva. My lord, we would be meeting Brihaspati. He is a chief scientist of the empire. He leads the team of scientists to manufacture the Somras for the entire country. Of course, they also conduct research in many other fields. A birch courier had already been sent to him, informing him of our arrival. We will be meeting him tomorrow morning. Shiva nodded slightly, smiled at Kanakala and said, thank you. As Nandi looked at the Prahar lamp again, Shiva went back to his book. It was in an interesting manuscript about the terrible war that was fought many thousands of years ago between the devas, the gods, and the asuras, the demons, an eternal struggle between the opposites, good and evil. The devas, with the help of Lord Rudra, the Mahadev, the god of gods, had destroyed the asuras and established the righteousness in the world again. I hope you step well, my lord, said Kanakala. As she welcomed Shiva and Nandi to the chamber outside Brihaspati's office, it was beginning of the last hour of the first prahar. Days began early at Mount Mandar. Yes, I did, said Shiva. Though there was a strange rhythmic sound around the night, Kanakala smiled but did not offer an explanation. She bowed her head and opened the door to let Shiva into Brihaspati's office. Shiva walked in followed by Kanakala and Nandi. There were various strange instruments spread throughout Brihaspati's large office, nearly organized on tables of different heights. There were palm leaf notes alongside each of the instruments, where some experiments had clearly seen conducted. The room was restrained blue. There was a large picture window in the corners which afforded a breathtaking view of the dense forest at the foot of the mountain. At the center, many simple low seats had been arranged together in a square. It was a frugal room in line with the culture of the celebrated simplicity over styled every turn. Brihaspati was standing in the center of the room, his hand folded in the namaste of medium height, much shorter than Shiva. His wheat-colored skin, deep-set eyes, and well-manicured beard gave Brihaspati a distinguished appearance. A clean-shaven head, except for the choti, a serene expression gave his face an intellectual look. His body was slightly overwet. His broad shoulders and barrel chest would have been markedly pronounced if they had been exercised a bit. But Brihaspati's body was a vehicle for his intellect and not the temple that it to be a warrior or kshatriya. 
Priyaspati wore a typical white cotton dhoti and an angvastram wrapped loosely over the shoulder. He wore a janayu tied from his left shoulder down to the right side of his hips. How are you, Kanakanda? asked Brihaspati. It has been a long time. Yes, it has, Brihaspati, said Kanakala. Greeting Brihaspati with a namaste and a low bow, Shiva noticed that the second amulet on Brihaspati's arm showed him a swan, a very select chosen tribe among the Brahmins. This is not Shiva, said Kanakala, pointing towards Shiva. Just Shiva will do. Thank you, smiled Shiva, with a polite namaste towards Brihaspati. All right then, just Shiva, it is. And who might you be? asked Brihaspati, turning towards Nandi. This is Captain Nandi, answered Kanakala, Lord Shiva's aid. A pleasure to meet you, Captain, said Brihaspati. Before turning back to Shiva, I don't mean to sound rude, Shiva, but would it be possible for me to see your throat? Shiva nodded as he took off his cravat. Brihaspati came forward to examine the throat. His smile disappeared as he saw Shiva's throat radiating a bright blue hue. Brihaspati was speechless for a few moments, slightly gathering his wits. He turned towards Kanakala. This is not a fraud. The color comes from inside. And how is this possible? This means that... Yes, said Kanakala, softly with a happiness that seems to emanate from the deep inside. It means... The Nilkant has come. Our saviour has come. Well, I don't know if I'm a saviour or anything like that, said an embarrassed Shiva, retying the cravat around his throat. But I will certainly try my best to help your wonderful country. It is for this reason that I come to you. Something tell me that it is important for me to know how the Somrask works. Brihaspati still seemed to be in daze. He continued to watch Shiva but his attention seemed elsewhere. He appeared to be working out the implication of the true Nilkant arrival. Brihaspati said Kanakala, as she tried to call the chief scientist back into the here and now. Can you tell me how the Somras works, Brihaspati? asked Shiva again. Of course, of course, said Brihaspati as his eyes refocused on the people in front of him. Noticing Nandi, he asked, is it all right to speak in front of the captain? Nandi has been my friend through my time in Maluha, said Shiva. I hope it is all right if he stays here. Nandi felt touched that his lord still trusted him as openly. Nandi wore once again on the pain of the death to never lie to his lord. Whatever you say, Shiva, said Brihaspati, smiling warmly. Shiva noticed that Brihaspati was not submissive or excessively differential on discovering that he was the Nilkant. Just like the Parvateshwar, Brihaspati called Shiva by his name and not by my lord. However, Shiva felt that while Parvateshwar's attitude was driven by distrusting surliness, Brihaspati was driven perhaps by an assured affability. Thank you, smiled Shiva. So, how does the Somras work? The royal procession moved slowly on the road to Mount Mandar. There was a pilot guard of 160 Calvary men who rode before the five royal carriages in the column of the four abreast. He re-argued of another one hundred and sixty rode behind the royal carriages in a similar formations, as a guard of forty each march along the left and the right flanks. Each carriage also had the soldiers and five serving made secret in the side supporters. The soldiers were the legendary Arishtinami, the most feared in all of India. The five carriages were made of solid wood with no windows or apertures except for the upward point the spits at the top for the ventilation. There was a grill in front behind the rider to allow an and light and air and thus could be shut instantly in case of an attack. All the carriages were of exactly the same dimensions and appearances making it impossible to say which carriage carried the royal family. If a person had Devya Rishi, the divine wisdom, to look beyond that human eyes could see, he would observe that the first, third and the fourth carriage were empty. The second carried the royal family, Daksha, his wife, Virini, and his daughter, Sati, the last carriage called Parvateshwar and some of his key brigadiers. Father, 
I still don't understand why you insist on talking me alone to pujas. I'm not just even allowed to attend the main ceremony, said Sati. I have told you many a times before, smiled Daksha, as he patted Sati's hand fondly. None of my pujas are complete and pure till I have seen our face. I don't care about the damn law. Father, whispered Sati, with an embarrassed smile and a slight reproachable shake of her head. She knew it was wrong of her father to insult the law. Sati's mother, Virini, looked off at Daksha with an awkward smile, then taking a quick look at Sati, returned to her book. At a short distance from the royal procession hidden by the dense forest, a small band of 50 soldiers slung along slightly. The soldiers wore light feather armors on their torso and had their dhotis tied in military style to ensure ease of the movement. Each of them bore two swords, a long knife, and had a hard shield made of metal and leather tied loosely around their back. Their shoes had grooves to hold three small knives. At the head were two men, one of them a handsome young man with a battle scar embellishing his face, wore a dark brown turban which signified that he was captain. His leather armor had tied little loose and a gold chain and a pendant had slipped out carelessly. The pendant had a beautiful white representation of a horizontal crescent moon the Chandravangshi symbol. Next to him walked a giant of man covered in a long rope from head to toe. A hood stitched onto the rope was pulled up while his face was covered with a black mask. Very little of him was visible except for his strong fleshy hands and his own symbol embroidered on it. Without turning to the captain, the hooded figure said, Vishwaduma, your mark is visible. Put it in and tighten your armor. And embarrassed, Vishwaduma immediately pushed the chain inside. My lord, begging your pardon, said Vishwaduma, but perhaps we would move ahead to confirm that this is the route to Mount Mandar. Once we know that, we'll be sure that our informant was correct. I'm sure that we can come back to kidnap her later. We are dangerously outnumbered in any of the case. We can't do anything right now. The hooded figure replied calmly, Vishwadumma, have I ordered an attack? Where does the questions of us being outnumbered come in? And we are going in the directions of Mount Mandal, and few hours' delay will not bring the heaven down. For now, we will actually follow. Vishwadumma swallowed hard. There was nothing he had hated more than opposing his kind view. After all, it was his lord who had found the rare Suryavanshis sympathize to their cause. The breakthrough would make it possible for them to rip out and destroy the very heart of Meluha. He spoke softly, but my lord, you know the quince doesn't like delays. There is unrest brewing amongst the men and perhaps the focus is being lost. The hooded figure turned sharply. His body seemed to convey anger, but his voice was composed. I'm not losing focus. If you want to leave, please go. You will get your money. I will do this alone if I had to. Shocked to see the rare show of emotion on his leader, Vishwadumma retracted immediately. No, my lord, that is not what I was trying to simplify. I'm sorry I will stay with you till you release me. You're right. A few hours will make no difference when we have waited for centuries. The plasmate continued the royal caravan silently. As a conceptual level, how the Somras was actually built is ridiculously simple, said Brihaspati. The almost impossible task was to convert the concept into reality. This was the genius of Lord Brahma, said Brihaspati Jayashri Brahma. Jayashri Brahma repeated Shiva, Kanakala and Nandi, before understanding how the medicine slows down the aging process. Dramatically, we have to understand what keeps us alive and there is a fundamental thing that none of us can live without. Shiva stared at Brihaspati. So when we walk, talk, drink, that is when we do anything that can be called being alive, we use energy. We have a similar concept amongst our people, said Shiva, 
except we all is shakti shakti acts a surprise brihaspati interestingly that word has not been used to describe energy for many centuries it was termed of the pandyas the ancestors of the old people of india do you know where your tribe came from their lineage i'm not really sure but there is an old woman in my tribe who claims to know everything about our history perhaps we would ask her when she comes to devagiri perhaps we should smile brihaspati in any of the case getting back to the subject we know nothing that can be done by our body without energy now where does this energy come from from the food that we eat suggested nandi timely it was finally getting the confidence to speak in front of such immortal people absolutely right the food that we eat stores energy which we can expand that's also why we don't eat we feel weak however you don't get energy just by eating food something inside the body has to draw the energy so that we can put it to good use absolutely agreed shiva the conversation of food into energy is done by the air we breathe continued brihaspati the air has various gases in it one of these gases is called oxygen which reacts with our food and releases energy so if we don't get oxygen our body would be starved of energy and we would die but this is a process that keeps us alive said shiva what does the medicine have to do with it the medicine has to work on that which causes us to grow old become weaker and die please with this smile what i told you does have something to do with how we age because as it happens or appears that nature has a dense of humor the very thing that keeps alive is also what causes to be the age and eventually die when oxygen reacts with our food to release energy it also releases free radicals called oxidant these oxidants are toxic as well as when you leave any fruit out and it goes bad it's because it has been oxidized or the oxidants have reacted with it to make it rot a similar oxidizing process which is actually called the metals to corrode it happens especially with our new metals we have discovered iron the same thing happens to our body when we breathe in oxygen the oxygen actually helps to convert into the food we eat into energy but it is also causes the release of the oxidant into our body which starts reacting inside us we rust from inside out and hence age and die by the holy god agni exclaimed nandi the very thing that gives us life also slowly kills us yes said brihaspati think about it the body tries to store everything that you need from outside world to survive it stores the food so that even if you don't eat for a few days you won't die it stocks up on water so that few days of thirst will not still be fatal it seems logically right if your body needs something it keeps some of it as a backup for possible shortages absolutely agreed shiva on the other hand the body does not store enough oxygen the most crucial component of staying alive to last for more than just a few minute it doesn't make sense at all the only explanation that can be done that the body releases or realizes that despite being an elixir oxygen is also a poison hence it is dangerous to store so what did brahma do ask shiva after a lot of research lord brahma invented the somras which when consumed reacts with the oxidants absorbs them and then expels them from the body as sweat or urine because of the somras that was uh, no oxidant left in the body is that why the sweat released from the body is poisoned at the first time after a person drinks the somras yes your sweat is particularly dangerous the first time after you think the somras having said that remember sweat and urine released from the body even after a person has actually drank the somras for years and remain toxic so you have to eject it from the body and make sure that it does not affect anyone else so that's why the maluhans are so obsessed with the property of hygiene yes that's why all the maluhans are taught about the two things from young age water and hygiene water is a cleanest absorber of the effluent that the somras generates and excretes a toxin 
Meluans are thought to drink gallons of water and everything that can be washed should be washed. The Meluans bathe at least twice a day. All ablution are done in specific rooms and the waste is carried out by means of underground drains safely out of the city. Strict hygiene standards, smiled Shiva. He remembered his first day in Kashmir. What goes into manufacturing somras? Manufacturing the somras is not without in its fair share of difficulty. It requires various ingredients that are not easily available. For example, the Sanjeevani tree. The empire has a giant plantation to produce these trees. The manufacturing procedure also generates lots of heat. So we have to use a lot of water during the processing to keep the mixture stable. Also, the crushed branches of the Sanjeevani tree have to be chewed with the waters of Saraswati. Water from the other sources doesn't actually work. Is that strange noise that I keep hearing the churners? That's exactly what is it. We have giant churning machines in a massive kavan at the base of the mountain. The Saraswati waters are led to here through a completely system of canals. The water is actually collected in an enormous pool in the cavern, which is affectionately called a sagar. Sagar, an ocean, you can call a pool of water by that name, asks a surprise shiver. For he had heard legends about the massive, never-ending spans of waters called sagar. It's a bit of hyperbole, admitted Brihaspati with a smile. But if you did see the size of the pool, you would realize that we are not that off the mark. Well, I would certainly like to see the entire facility. It was too late when we came in the last night, so I haven't seen much of the mountain as yet. I will take you around after the lunch, said Brihaspati. Shiva grinned in reply. He was about to say something, but checked himself in time, looking in at both Kanakala and Nandi. Brihaspati noticed the hesitation. He felt Shiva might want to ask him something but not in front of Nandi and Kanakala. Brihaspati turned to them and said, I think Shiva wants to ask me something. May I request you to wait outside? It was a measure of the respect that Brihaspati commanded that Kanakala immediately rose to leave the room after a formal namaste, followed by Nandi. Brihaspati turned to Shiva with a smile. Why don't you ask me the real question you came to ask?